Learning Ally is a proud sponsor of the Empowered Dyslexia podcast. Learning Ally, a nonprofit education organization, helps to transform the lives of struggling learners by delivering proven solutions that help students reach their potential. We have a heritage of supporting students with a reading deficit like dyslexia. Our award-winning Human Red audiobook solution helps students in grades 3 through 12 access books they want and need to read to help them succeed. Visit www.learningally.org for more information. Hello world, wake me up to another good, good morning, time to go. Oh, we are all looking for adventure. We are all looking for adventure. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Empower Dyslexia. I'm your host, Stephen Yearout, and this show is here to help you become a better partner in education. On this show, we discuss dyslexia, we discuss uh, other related disorders, we discuss research, we discuss special education policy at the state, federal, and even our local um, area. We also interview experts in their field, and my favorite part is we speak to um, those of us who have lived with these disabilities our entire life and have um, come out the other side. So, you know, welcome, and I'm excited to be here, and this show um, is one that we've been needing to do for a while uh, around what is and how do you identify speech and language disorders. Please be able, or please like us on Facebook and subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. You can, uh, if you want to watch live, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, we actually have our own app on Fire TV now. And then all of, if you want to listen to the show, all your favorite apps that you get your podcasts on, you can download it there. Again, remember to subscribe, leave us a comment. It helps us with our algorithms. And uh, so our, our special guest today is Dr. Robin Edge. She is an SLP and she's a professor at Jacksonville University in Florida. Welcome, Dr. Edge. Hi, Stephen and your Empower Dyslexia audience. I am thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So let's start out with, um, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, what do you do at the university? Uh, a little bit about your education. Let's start there. Sure. So I have been in the field of speech language pathology since 2000. I did my training at the University of Georgia and at Bob Austin State University, both in Georgia. Um, I opened a private practice after graduation and working for a few years um, in the school system and in a medical setting in Social Circle, Georgia, outside of Atlanta, and did that for about 12 years, specializing predominantly in pediatrics. Uh, we worked a lot with children with autism. We did a lot of work with children with ADHD, uh, literacy disorders, language and learning disabilities, speech sound disorders, all things we'll talk about today, kind of break down what that is. Um, and in 2012, I decided to go full-time into academia, initially taking a position at the University of Mississippi, and then a couple years later was uh, recruited to come to Jacksonville, Florida to help start a speech pathology program at Jacksonville University. So we are finishing up our sixth class and have had almost 200 graduates of the Master's in Science and Speech Language Pathology program down at Jacksonville University. So we're thrilled for that. I got involved in the field predominantly because I felt it was so important to help parents advocate for themselves, for their children. And I always had a passion for education, but my specific passion within education was working with children with extraordinary needs, working with children that didn't have the same socioeconomic opportunities that others did. I spent my career in low-income communities working with patients. It's always been a passion of mine. And now at the college level, extending that to first-generation college students and students that are attending college for the very first time don't have family history at a university level. And I feel it's so important to give those students a support system to ensure their success. I mean, that's, that's an amazing amount of work um, 
for such a for such a short time. Um, I, thank you so much for all that, that what you're doing out there. The fact that you've produced you said 200 uh, speech pathologists now. Mm -hmm. um, and where do they norm? I mean, do they really disperse across the United States or? They do. Actually, about half of our students are from the Northeast. Um, we have the other half are in the Southeast Florida region traditionally, but um, it, it's interesting though, Stephen, many of them, even from out of state, end up staying in Jacksonville and, you know, fall in love with the city. If you've never been to Jacksonville, it's a really rich area in medical community. We have the sixth largest school system in the country, so school-based services are large there. So as a speech pathologist, it gives you a wide array of working opportunities from medical, educational, private practice, um, outpatient clinics. So a lot of our students end up staying um, when they have the initial intention to go back home um, to work, for sure. So we are growing so fast that in fall of 2021, we're actually launching a satellite program in Palm Coast, Florida, to admit a second um, section of students. So we'll have an extra 25 students down there live for the very first time this fall. So we are uh, hiring faculty members. We are, we've already got a full class admitted. We are so excited to be joining the Palm Coast area as a extension of Jacksonville University coming this fall. That's great. So, you know, as a parent uh, of two boys who have dyslexia, you know, when we're going through the initial identification process, um, you know, there's lots of acronyms and lots of, of, you know, specialists that get, that get thrown at you. And a lot of times parents don't really understand, you know, what that particular position is. What does it do? Why are they there? Other than in the name of the title, speech and language pathologist, what is that? I mean, could you give us a really good definition of what is it? Why is it important? Absolutely. So that's the number one question that I get, because most people assume from speech language pathology, oh, you help kids learn how to talk. And it's so much bigger than that. So a speech pathologist can work with patients that have speech, language, communication, or swallowing disorders from birth on to literally end of life death situations. We may work with patients in hospice, for instance, that have some sort of swallowing difficulty. We may work with babies in the neonatal intensive care unit um, that have challenges having been born early and anything in between. So we work on language issues, including literacy. We work on speech issues that can be speech sound disorders when people have difficulty saying their sounds correctly, fluency disorders, including stuttering and cluttering. Um, and then we work with lots of neurological impairments and deficits, anybody that's had a stroke, anybody that has any sort of, um, you know, neurological deficit such as ALS or um, they have dementia, for instance, Parkinson's. We can work with any of those patients with the goal of improving communication, improving swallowing. Those are our wheelhouses. That's what we're put here to do. And so from any age group, if there's speech, language, communication, swallowing deficits, you may encounter a speech pathologist um, in that realm. But that's what makes it challenging sometimes for patients to find a speech pathologist because our scope of practice, what we're qualified to do upon graduation from a program is so vast that it's impossible for most of us to specialize in everything, right? It's rare to find a therapist. I don't know that I've ever seen a therapist that is a specialist in all areas, birth to geriatrics, you know, language literacy. So one of the challenges I found in my career is parents get overwhelmed with, number one, how do I find a therapist? Or if I have a therapist, how do I determine if they're the best fit for my child, you know, for my spouse, for whomever needs the services? So that's something that I'm hoping today we can address is if you're looking for a therapist, how do you find one? And if you have come upon a therapist, how do you know what their skill set is and if it matches up with the needs that you and your family have? Yeah, I would have never guessed that it was as deep as from birth to geriatric. Um, I mean, you're right. When you, as a parent, 
when you hear a speech pathologist or, or you know, most of the time we hear your child's going to speech, that's all we think is that you're going to keep them or teach them how to say their um, words correctly, their sounds correctly, and, you know, work with them if they are stuttering. You know? Absolutely. And so there's so many things we can target literacy, reading, we can target um, reading comprehension, we can target target their language, what they're understanding or their um, receptive language is how we look at you know, what they understand when they hear it, what they understand when they read, and then also what they're expressing. You know, is there a delay or a disorder in how your child can communicate their language? We also work with students who need augmentative or alternative communication devices. You know, maybe a patient is nonverbal for whatever reason. It's our job to come in and get them a method to communicate, whether that is a low-tech device that, you know, a, a corner board, you know, literally using picture cards for them to point and communicate, or it can be as extensive as a high-tech computer eye-gazing device where they communicate with eye tracking to look at the computer icons and the computer communicates for them. So that's another realm of what we do um, that many people don't know or understand. Now, granted, one of the most exciting things about being a speech pathologist for me is we do have to work collaboratively with other professionals, right? It's very common to work with occupational, physical therapists, obviously parents, teachers, you know, lots of different people make up the team to make a child or any patient successful. We're one piece of that program, but when we're dealing with communication and following issues, we're often the team lead and can drive um, the treatment plans in identifying what everybody needs to be successful. So it's interesting. One of the first things that you said was you work with, you, you also can work with children in reading. Um, and as we've had a discussion before, um, our host for Empower Dyslexia Australia is an SLP, and that is who they use in Australia. That's who they use to... Um, remediate or provide remediation for the dyslexic students. I know here we use, you know, they, they have all, uh, all kinds of names, but the main one is a certified academic language therapist, uh, is, is the main one that people will he hear about. Um, do you see that that is, um, indicative of the rest of the world that they use a speech pathologist instead of, you know, a trained reading specialist or something like that? Is that I mean, does that it's make really sense? variable. Um, it's common in Ireland, for example, for speech pathologists to be um, medically based and not as educationally based. So it really is on a country by country basis. Um, for a while, probably 25 plus years ago, speech pathologists weren't as dialed into literacy. It wasn't a large part of our part of our scope of practice, what we were encouraged to do. And in the early 2000s, we as a field looked and went, wait a minute, reading is a part of language. It's not, you can't separate the two. And, you know, children with developmental language disorders are six times as likely to have spelling and reading difficulties than a child without a developmental language disorder. So it's impossible to separate the issues that these child, these kids have because they often overlap. Right. So at that point, our national organization, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, backed up and made a position statement very upfront about our role in terms of working with children with reading disabilities um, and understanding that there is a definite connection between literacy and language and speech pathologists should be on the front lines of that. Um, but to your point, Stephen, I found even within the U.S., each state tends to do it differently. Um, some states, speech pathologists in the education um, model are more involved and in other states, like I think in Texas, you can speak way more to that than I can. Um, they don't have quite as large of a role in treating those kids um, as they might in other states. Yeah, I've, I've never understood that, that the fact that the speech pathologist especially in, in, in IEP meetings, they're generally kind of 
you know, a second into the to cut into the conversation. Um, I, you know, they're one of the the key people here, especially like you were saying when we're trying to talk about communication, we're talk, talking about language, we're talking about reading. Um, so I've challenged a few people on this. I'm, we need uh, this is my own personal, you know, kind of rant here about speech. I really think that our K through second grade uh, classrooms should have. Uh, those teachers should have some level of knowledge um, or training in speech because you walk in any of those classrooms and the majority of these kids are not pronouncing the words correctly. And some of that particular piece is developmental. Right. You know, we know we develop sounds over time, right? So you're not going to have a four-year-old that has R's and L's all the time correctly, and that's right. developmentally appropriate. But to your point, if I were in charge of academic programming for teachers, I would make it mandatory that they have at least an introductory course in speech and language issues so that they do know what to be looking out for. Because many times teachers are the front lines of referral sources, right? Yeah, it helps you identify I think them. pathologists may not know a kid has an issue until a teacher comes to me to say, hey, I'm seeing this with my student. Should I refer or not? I've worked with amazing teachers that are so dialed in and know what to look for. And the referral process, the collaboration process is amazing. But that's not always the case. Right. So. One of my roles as a professor now in speech pathology is to help teach our students on the importance of working with teachers, being on the front lines, being open and honest with them, being willing to take the extra time to have these discussions when they have questions of what am I seeing? Is this normal? Is this abnormal? How should I move forward in terms of do we need to start the RTI process, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's important for education for parents, of course, but also for teachers, because they don't always come with that knowledge base that we wish that they had to be successful. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the reasons at the beginning of the show, I say, we're here to help you become a better informed partner in education, because as parents, that's what we are. We're a partner in education with our teachers, with any of the other staff, if we if we have a speech pathologist there or, you know, special education uh, teachers, our certified academic, academic language therapists, whatever it is, we're here to be a partner. And we as parents have to be educated in this also. So let's jump back to um, two things. Can you can you give us um, some idea for parents? Number one, when is it? Uh, appropriate to start looking for uh, a speech pathologist and how do you find them? Absolutely. Even before I discuss that, I want to back up and just give parents almost a little bit of a pep talk. I've worked with many, many very, you know, most of them highly educated, motivated parents that are always looking for what's best for their child. They are advocating, they are pushing, they're doing all the right things. And they continue to tell me, I'm so intimidated when I walk into these IEP meetings, when I am faced with a table full of professionals, that no matter how you know, intelligent, how um, you know, motivated you are as a parent, it can be intimidating when you're staring at four, five, six professionals that are experts in their field, right? So my advice to you is number one, if you need help with that, there are advocacy groups, there are advocates that you can work with, there are parent groups, you know, find people in your area that can support you, that can give you um, hints or tips on how to be successful there. The other thing though, is to try not to be intimidated. I know that's easier said than done, but you know your child better than anybody else in the room and you are an integral part of the team. It breaks my heart when some parents explain to me how they feel like their opinion didn't matter, that they don't have a seat at the table, and you do have a seat at the table. You know, federal law gives you parental rights that you have a seat at the table, you have a say. If anybody ever makes you feel like that's not true, you have the right and, you know, should be taking into your own hands of let me find somebody to help me figure out why, why I'm not being valued, why I'm not being heard. 
So I want to put parents' minds at ease that that's not indicative of your parenting skills, your knowledge base. You know, it's a common feeling, um, but, you know, your listeners can feel free to reach out to me and I can give resources of if you're lost in that overwhelmed stage, if you have a child that possibly you've just gotten a new diagnosis with and you're trying to navigate your way, please reach out for support because it is there. So to circle back to your question, how do you find a speech language pathologist? The first place to start is ASHA, the American Speech Language Hearing Association. Their website is asha.org and there you'll be able to find a list of um, certified speech language pathologists nationwide. They typically do give you some information about whether they specialize in pediatrics, adults. We have to list on there what areas of expertise we have. Because as we talked about earlier, we can do so many things. It's important to find a speech pathologist that's working in her scope of competence, meaning with patients that are similar to yours, that has experience working with whatever need it is that you have, whether it's you know, literacy, speech language, you know, swallowing, whatever the case may be. You know, for me in particular, one of my specialty areas is stuttering. I found that there aren't, uh, you know, many therapists in my area that have a whole lot of experience working with patients who stutter. So it's important if, you know, you do have somebody who stutters that you're asking questions. How many, you know, patients have you worked with who stutter? You know, what therapy techniques do you use and why? How successful have you been? What outcomes are you looking for? You know, what therapy goals are you working on? Being able to ask those open and honest questions to therapists. You know, most therapists I know are very open and willing to talk about this thing. I want you to ask me those questions. I want you to be involved. So don't just think, oh, I've got a referral to an SLP. I have to take the first one I see. Definitely be open and willing to ask those questions. And, um, you know, ask if you have parents of, you know, fellow parent friends who they've had success with. I know in Jacksonville, our parent groups have really rich Facebook um, groups together so they can talk about, hey, my son's dealing with X. Has anybody had a resource in town or had a similar experience or worked with the therapist or, and, you know, pediatrician, et cetera, et cetera. So leaning into, you know, online resources for parent groups in your area can be a really, really big help when you're trying to navigate that. And I will echo as a parent advocate that when you go into these ARD meetings or a 504 meeting, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room when it comes to whatever that topic is. However, I will say, do not be afraid to ask the questions. The people that are across the table from you should either A, have the answers or go get the answers for you. So make sure that you're asking the questions. If you don't understand, ask it again. Keep asking it until you understand the information. And the, the other piece of that is trust but verify. Take in the information, go research what it was told to you, make sure that the information is correct. That is for I know for us in the year out household, that is, was the biggest thing for us when we were uh, in there being an advocate for our kids for dyslexia. Absolutely. You know, I would say a hundred percent, again, I will never take offense if my patients and their families are asking me questions over and over again, if they want to verify information, the one, you know, what, a topic that you just touched on that I really stress with my graduate students is if you don't know the answer to a question, own that and say, I'm not sure, but by X time, the next time we meet, by next week, by tomorrow, I will do my due diligence. I will reach out to colleagues. I will reach out to ASHA, our national organization. I will do my best to find that information for you. Um, you know, that's part of our role is to support you know, parents, but we can't know everything, right? Absolutely. So I would rather have somebody be willing to own that and say, I'm not hundred percent sure. Let me go find the data and bring it back to you versus trying to, you know, skirt through it when they really don't have the information that they need for sure. Absolutely. I would never expect the person that's sitting across the table from me uh, to know every answer that I throw at them. 
our question I throw at him. Um, so in your, in your research, in your studies, in your, in your field, do you see, um, we talked about stuttering and I, you know, we've talked about this on the show. My oldest son stuttered, um, before he went into school and he was in speech and now he doesn't. Do you see a, a comorbidity or a co-occurrence a lot of times with children that have dyslexia and stuttering? It's interesting. Stuttering is an interesting question because um, there are many, many young kids that, quote, stutter. And I say, quote, because many of them grow out of it. Many of them get better either with treatment or without, and it's no longer an issue for them. But there is. Out of the group of kids who stutter, up to 80% of them will not stutter into adulthood. It will be something like your son that remediates either with professional help or without sometimes. But there is that 20% of kids who start to stutter when they're young and will continue to stutter into adulthood. And we do know, as we talked about earlier, with developmental language disorders, there is a strong correlation between children who struggle with developmental language disorders and dyslexia. Um, there is not a whole lot there with um, dyslexia and stuttering per se, but there are co-occurrences. You know, it's not uncommon for sure. Um, but in stuttering specifically, people often misinterpret someone who stutters as having um, intellectual differences than the normal population. I would say that's true for people with dyslexia as well. It's easy for people to make the assumption that because you have dyslexia or because you stutter that you aren't as smart as everybody else, which is not true at all. Right. We know there is no correlation between intellect, aptitude. You know, oftentimes with my patients who stutter specifically, they have, you know, above average IQs, above average intellect. Definitely, I would say with the patients I've worked with with dyslexia, and I use patients and students kind of interchangeably, having a medical and an educational background. Um, but my students with dyslexia and who stutter both have, in my personal anecdotal clinical experience, above average motivation and drive to get it right, right? Because they're used to having to work harder than their peers without dyslexia or without stuttering to read or communicate, as it were. Um, and so I think that's a really important point that um, if you ask me why early intervention is important, why getting your child help as early as possible is important, you know, obviously we want to build the skills up. We want to build their reading, you know, get their reading level up to um, grade level. We want to get them to be able to communicate with minimal disfluencies or with minimal tension in the disfluencies that they have. Absolutely. But I think the bigger picture is we want to intervene before these kids start to internalize, oh, I'm stupid. I'm a bad reader. I'm a bad talker. I'm not good at this. I can't communicate. I'm less than. Because breaking those thought patterns, that negativity, that self-worth is what it develops into, that can sometimes be harder than remediating the skills, Absolutely. right? And so if we can get to those kids early before they get to sixth, seventh, eighth grade or adulthood with this preconceived notion of I can't do X because I'm stupid, because I can't read well, because I can't speak well, that is huge. That's why I'm a monster advocate for early intervention. The earlier, the better. So if you have a therapist say to you or a doctor, oh, don't worry about it, he'll grow out of it, and you're not comfortable with that, then go somewhere else. Keep searching, keep finding, you know, make them listen to you. I can't tell you how many parents of kids who stutter by the time they get to me are very emotional about it because they've asked their doctors or they've asked other professionals to say, oh, it's fine he or she will grow out of it. And a lot of kids do. It's true. A lot of kids do spontaneously recover. But if a parent is so concerned that their child isn't going to be one of those kids that recovers, that should be valued. That should be heard. They shouldn't be fussed off into a, a wait and see approach because that early intervention can make a huge, huge difference in our child's life. I, I think that point was, was really, really important. The fact that don't wait I mean, we say that at the end of every show, if you think that your child could possibly have a learning disability, a speech disability, a language disability, 
don't wait. Don't, you know, that was like we're saying that was, that was an old ideology that we can't test kids for dyslexia, dyslexia until third grade. We can't teach them, you know, we can't really do speech until this time because their uh, sounds and their, their uh, tongue isn't strong enough. I mean, I've heard everything that you could possibly imagine to make these sounds. Their, their mouth muscles aren't strong enough to make these sounds. Da, 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 da. Don't worry about it. Wait until X, X point, right? But like you said, so now we're talking, we have a 10 year old that still stutters or still mispronounces words and miss does, you know, this. And he's struggling and that's, that's causing the social and emotional issues. That is such a hot topic in schools right now. I, I really wish, uh, and I'm not going to go that all education, uh, doesn't see it, but I really wish or hope that we can get to a point that the education system sees that, that delay in identification is one of the major factors in the social and emotional issues that our children are dealing with today. Absolutely. And I'll say, and I let, me, some... let, me add to, let me add to this, sorry. Not only our children, but our adults that have lived with their entire life. Absolutely. You know, I've worked with adults who stutter who tell me that they picked their college major based on something that they would be able to work remotely and they wouldn't have to talk to people. You know, they picked their college classes before that, going through the syllabi and the course descriptions to determine which ones they wouldn't have to speak out in class. The fact that some people, not all, but some people are inhibited to that level, even into adulthood, is heartbreaking to me. That, you know, if we can get those sorts of social, emotional, cognitive issues addressed early, it will make a huge impact on a child and adult as they grow up quality of life, for sure. Um, to piggyback on the early intervention, though, some counties, some school systems are really good. One of the counties I worked for in Georgia, we screened every incoming kindergarten student for language and speech issues. That was part of their intake process. So that does happen um, to, in some you know, school systems across the country, but it's variable. You know, each state has different setups for their educational system, and even within the state, each county can do things differently within that realm. So you have to be very proactive. The one caution that I do want to make to the previous comment is understanding as a speech pathologist, there are different models depending on the environment where we work. So if we work in the schools, we're in an educational model, obviously. And so speech pathologists there are bound by the criteria for inclusion of services that the county sets out. When we work at any county, we're given these are the criteria a student has to meet to get services for speech and language in our county. And if they fall outside of that, they may or may not get services. So I'll give you an example. In some counties, a student that has a list that has difficulty saying S and Z sounds, that if it doesn't have what they deem an academic impact on the child, meaning his grades are fine, he doesn't seem to have any social issues going on, he wouldn't qualify for services in an educational model. He could, however, qualify for services in a medical model because that's a different um, structure. We don't have the stringent criteria for inclusion that we often have in an educational system. And what can be frustrating for parents is that changes, again, county to county, even within the states and definitely state to state. So if you move in from you know, New York, for example, into Florida, your experience may be different um, because the Board of Education has set up different inclusion criteria, different therapy models, different types of um, service structures, and that can be very frustrating for some parents as well. So I don't want listeners to hear me say, oh, keep advocating, keep fighting for your child. Many times a speech pathologist is bound by those rules set up by the Board of Education. So affecting change at that level is bigger. You know, you'd have to go to Board of Education and sometimes at the state level to enact change. You're seeing that firsthand in Texas for sure. Well, and you're talking about state to state getting different, is it fair to say, level of speech uh, care with inside the educational model, state to state. We see the same thing in dyslexia. 
I mean, we actually still today have states here in the United States in 2021 that do not acknowledge that dyslexia is a real thing. It just mind blowing. Absolutely mind blowing. So, um, so let's, let's go down this path a little bit. So we identify that our child has a speech need. Well, let me back up a little bit. Um, we, we talked about speech, um, speech disorder or a language disorder. When, when that diagnosis is given, is that an umbrella term that covers multiple different areas or are they two different things? So it depends on the state that you're in. In the state of Georgia, for instance, when your child has a um, speech and language diagnosis, it is kind of an umbrella term. So if I'm working with a student, which in my experience is not uncommon, he may be referred to me for a language disability, for instance. And as we're working together, I see some issues in stuttering or I see some speech sound disorder issues. It's actually, I think, more common for me to be working with somebody that has speech sound disorder issues, you know, maybe a phonological processing disorder. And then we start digging into more broader language issues, meaning he's struggling to understand what he hears, he's struggling to follow directions, etc. So in many states, I can do some evaluation, um, more data collection, and we can pretty easily add that um, into his plan of care by the speech therapist at that school. In some states, though, they break out and you need a speech impairment label or a language impairment label, and it's not the same umbrella. So for in Jacksonville, Florida, for instance, that's the way it works. So if I'm treating a child for speech sound disorders and I see something going on with his language and think, wait, we need to check this out, he has to go back through the referral process again to have the language testing and diagnosis. Whereas in states that make it more of an umbrella together, it's easier to not have to start over and go through RTI and start from the very beginning. So that's going to vary um, state to state. And again, sometimes even county to county within the state. So where does that fall under IDEA? Meaning? The, the category. Like dyslexia is under SLD's specific learning disability. However, most people, especially yeah. here in Texas, we don't like to to recognize that um, and we just say hey here's a 504 enjoy um, where does this yeah we have a speech language impairment you know you uh, have your own section okay mm -hmm. I just didn't know if yeah. if the states broke it out like what you were talking about uh, or you know IDEA is is federal law if language impairment really goes under SLD and speech has its own or, or how that works, just so our parents right. understand your legal protections. Absolutely. You know, um, speech language impairment is anything falling under, like we talked about speech disorders, language disorders, could be even swallowing disorders. It's not common in the schools, although we can work with uh, medically fragile children, right? We have had, um, I've gone in and done home care for students that were unable to attend school, but were still getting services through their school um, and did have some really pretty extensive medical issues that warranted some swallowing therapy um, done at a home case. Um, but also it could be done in school. You know, we could have children that have swallowing issues in schools as well. So we do have our own categories there. Typically the structure though, um, if I have a child that only has speech or language issues, I'm their primary, you know, caseload contact. I'm the person in charge of writing their IP. I'm the person that's going to lead the team. But if I have a child that has co-occurring issues, so maybe they have a learning disability diagnosis and a speech and language diagnosis, then the teacher that's in charge of the LD, the learning disability piece of his education, they're going to lead the IEP team and I'm going to be a contributor. I'm going to be a secondary player to that. So if speech and language is the primary diagnosis, your speech language pathologist is going to be your team lead. If it's co-occurring with some other disorders that fall under a different category in IDEA, we're going to be a 
contributor to the IEP, but we won't be the team lead in that. That will always fall to the LD or the special education teacher in that case. In in Georgia or in the states that you have knowledge of, um, in order to get speech through the school, does that fall under uh, special education also? Because that's the way it is here in, in Texas. It does. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what do we, well, number one, what skills do we need to um, be looking for if we have to go out and um, get a speech pathologist? Again, you, you were starting with the ASHA.org site. Um, we'll see if I'll let you finish up. Uh, I, I was just saying that, you know, you were saying that the, the speech pathology is such a huge um, field. So, I mean, what's the most important things that we really, we as parents need to be looking for, for skills from the person that we are going to hire? Absolutely. That's a great question. So going to the ASHA.org site, as we talked about, is a great place to start. Many people don't realize if your therapist has CCCSLP, you probably saw that at the end of my name, that stands for the Certificate of Clinical Competence as a Speech Language Pathologist. And what that's saying is I'm nationally certified. I have to pass a national certification test after I've done a minimum of a master's degree. You pass your national certification test and graduating speech pathologists for their first year working have to work under an already credentialed speech language pathologist. It's called the clinical fellowship experience. So that first year, even after graduation, they still have to mentor, have to be observed, their skills have to be tracked by somebody certified because our organization is all about are we competent. We want to put a premium on making sure therapists that have their ASHA-Cs are minimally competent across that lifespan, birth to death, as we talked about, right, and all the different areas that fall under that. That being said, Traditionally, what happens, we end up taking a job and we specialize based on the patients that we see. You know, if I am in a reading clinic, for instance, and all of the patients I work with have literacy disorders, then if I've done that 20 years, I'm not going to be competent anymore to work with a patient with swallowing disorders that I haven't done that since my graduate programming 20 years prior, right? right. So being the ASHA site will give you our specialization areas so you can pick through there. If your child has autism, you need to look for somebody that ticks off. They have experience working with autism. But even taking that a step further, asking these therapists questions so you get a sense of their knowledge base. You know, are how do they make treatment decisions? Do they use evidence-based practice? And I want to put an asterisk on evidence-based practice because it's a buzzword. Mm -hmm. I'm sure all of you have heard it for various things, you know, in your life. But making sure a therapist is actually doing that and knowing what that means is really important, not just them throwing the term out. So if you're unfamiliar with evidence-based practice, the model, um, the original model from in medicine that we adapted into speech pathology and other areas as well, think of it in terms of like a triangle. So clinical decisions should be made based on your triangles. You've got your three points. One point is patient and family, you know, input, values. Why are you coming to me to help you or your child? What do you want to get out of therapy? What are your goals? That is a piece of evidence-based practice that people sometimes, for you know, may not realize. I get a say. The patient and their family, they get a say at the table. Another piece of that is clinical experience. You know, what's in the speech pathologist's wheelhouse? What do they... Um, have they been trained to do? What are they good at? What does their clinical experience tell them about working with similar patients to the one that they have with them now? And then the third piece of it is the research evidence. And here's where my take on this is very passionate and a little bit different than some other people you may meet. In my mind, it's not good enough to just find a research article and run with it. We as therapists need to have the skills to be able to figure out the quality of the research, right? Because you can publish research and it can be researched in a journal, but it can be very poorly done and it can give you outcomes that aren't going to be applicable or able to be replicated in the real world, right? I mean, we all know pseudoscience 
things that look like science that sound really spiffy and you know great present as legitimate science if you don't have the wherewithal to evaluate it critically to see is this legitimate science or is this pseudoscience. So asking therapists questions to make sure they're making their treatment decisions based on tried and true legitimate evidence, not just what they learned 20 years ago in their master's program or not just what they Googled last night and found on YouTube, right? Being very upfront about here are our needs, here's what we're looking from this, what experience do you have, what treatments have you done with similar students to mine, and why, why were you doing those? The other piece of it that I just drill and practice into my students is we as therapists have an obligation to take really concrete, strong data when we work with our students, with our clients. Every goal that my clients have, I need to be tracking data so I can make my treatment decisions, change things up, dismiss goals based on that student's performance by me logging that and tracking that every session, not just, oh, I think this is how he's doing, or let me talk to the teacher and 100% relying on the teacher. That's important. I want the teacher's input, but I also want to take data every session that I work with them and that performance data, tracking the changes in the student that I'm working with is going to help me drive my treatment decisions and change things up whether they're working or not, right? So that's important. Getting a clinician that values data and values individualization of a plan for your child rather than just doing the same thing they've always done and expecting your child to fall in line. Um, because we know everybody doesn't learn the same way. That's kind of my mantra. How can I teach therapists to understand even, you know, you may have two children with dyslexia, both 10 years of age, both males, both with similar socioeconomic backgrounds. The same techniques may not work with both of those kids because everybody's different. We all have learning, different learning styles, different learning strategies that work for us. So it's our job as therapists to individualize our assessments and our treatments to find what works for each individual child that we work with. I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, that, that's, that's what we preach here every day. Uh, and, and really f for our parents out there, if you really listen to what Dr. Edge was saying, it really comes down to asking questions, ask questions constantly. These are your babies and you want to make sure that this person has competent answers to be able to say, why are we doing X, Y, Z? And we got to make sure that there's progress monitoring going on. Okay. Absolutely. We're not going to continue doing the same therapy for 10 years and just saying, well, we need to keep doing this because this is what I was told we have to do. If there's not gains, if there's not a visible gain, if there's not real progress being made, we need to make a change. Absolutely. You know, it makes me crazy to get into an IEP meeting and see a child that's been working on R for 10 years. This poor student has been sitting in a therapist's office from the time they were in third grade, and now they may be going into 10th grade, and they're still drilling and practicing R. If it's not working, change your therapy techniques up. Go back to the literature. Take some continuing education courses. That's the therapist's job, right? Um, and so if you've if your therapist is stagnant, ask the questions. And again, be willing to have them say, I'm not sure, but I'll go find it. I'll go ask. I'll go you know, reach out to my network of fellow therapists. Go to the ASHA website. We as therapists have a wealth of information available to us through the ASHA website, research, uh, continuing education, networking with other therapists throughout the country. We have the ability to find those answers. And so as a parent, Trying to find a therapist that's open and willing to do the digging, to say to you, yep, we've been working on this goal for several months. It's not working. I'm not sure what to do next, but I'll find that information. I'll bring back to you why I want to change it up and why I want to do a different treatment technique. It's really important. Progress monitoring matters. Don't accept somebody that says, oh, well, it is what it is and keeps on keeping on. No, no. We have to monitor your child's progress. That's our job. So if they try to tell you otherwise, 
call them on it. Don't be fearful in asking, 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 advocating, asking questions. Um, and you know, you may need a therapist that isn't okay with that. Well, there are other therapists out there or, you know, you, you can encourage them to be okay with that. Cause I would say that's a huge part of our scope of practice as a therapist. That's my job to not only work with your child on skills, but to educate the family, to be partners with the family. We are partners. Try to not see yourself as, you know, in a business structure as the therapist is the boss and you're the employee, you're partners, you're equals in your child's education. And so you may have to circle through multiple therapists to find somebody that's that great fit that gets you and gets your family and gets the style that you need. But please don't be fearful. Please don't settle for anything less than what works for you and your child. Well, awesome. I I know that we have covered a lot of ground here and I really would ask um, that you come back because I want to do some more deep dives into language disorders, into speech disorders and really understand um, what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, like Absolutely. We, like I'd love to do that. Dyslexia. Um, I want to give you the last minute. Uh, I mean, if there's any questions or anything that I didn't ask you or that you feel very strongly that information that parents need to know, I'm going to give you the last minute of the show to, um, to give our parents this information. So take it away. We, we've talked a good bit about it already, but I just want parents to hear me say that I empathize with you. If you're a parent that's gotten a relatively new diagnosis and you're in that phase where you're overwhelmed, people are coming at you with lots of information and you're just trying to get your feet under you. Number one, that's very common. It's, it's very, very common for most parents to feel that way. And please feel empowered in finding other parent support groups, as we talked about earlier, other professionals that can help guide your um, knowledge base and asking questions, making sure you fact check people. Don't just trust somebody is giving you all of the correct information. I would love to think, and, and most of the therapists and students that I know really do come from a place of wanting to help you, wanting to help your family. It comes from a place of doing the right thing, but it still doesn't give you a pass to just trust that. So dig deep, you know, find information. Don't necessarily trust everything you read online, even with the information you find. Be critical, be a critical thinker. Always ask, always question, always advocate. Don't be scared to advocate for your child because the reality is any therapist, any group that works with you, Yes, we know your child, but not as well as you do. So when somebody says to you, oh, well, we don't see it that way, you know your child better than anybody else on the planet. Don't ever lose that grounding and don't ever not see yourself as just as important at that table in your child's education than everybody else there for sure. Well, thank you so much for coming on, taking the time today to come on our show and speak to our uh, viewers and listeners. Um, and, and thank you again for all that you do, helping our children um, and, and producing high quality therapists out there for our population. Um, and again, thank you for accepting my offer to come back and, and really deep dive into um, our speech and language disorders um, that that uh, co-occur lots of times with our students with dyslexia. So, Absolutely. This was a really timely discussion. Um, May is actually Better Speech and Hearing Month. So our profession makes a conscious effort every May to get out to lots of media outlets nationwide and talk about issues important to us, advocate with um, our state and federal level representatives on issues, laws, bills that are important to us. So I appreciate being given the opportunity to talk about anything speech and language related, but especially during May when it's better speech and hearing month. So thank you for having me. That's awesome. So um, real quick on events, we have an event coming up on June 4th. We're going to have a booth at the Learning Ally Virtual Conference uh, June 4th, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, 
And if you can't attend the live session, it's all going to be on demand uh, up until December 1st. So there is a, um, we have our own discount code with Learning Ally. It's SPOD, S-P-O-D, Empower. Uh, all one word, all capital, S-P-O-D, Empower. And you will actually get $20 off your registration fee if you use that discount code, SPOD, S-P-O-D, Empower. And I'll put some information in the description here at the, um, at the end of the show. Um, make sure that you come by our virtual booth and we'll have our hosts for Empower Dyslexia there. You can come in and talk to us and uh, we'd love to meet you. And they have some really good keynote speakers. Uh, Andrew Lewis, who is a Olympic sailor. We have Dr. Kilpatrick, who has been um, in the research field around dyslexia forever. Uh, Dr. Susan Hall, who... Um, the same thing. She's been in, in the research around um, reading disabilities and language um, that is going to be presenting also. Uh, at the end of every show, we always like to recommend that if you feel that your child is, is uh, falling behind in school, that there's a possibility of a, a learning disability, the time to get that assessed is now. Don't wait. The process is a very easy process. It very it should be a very easy process uh, to start. We have templates on our website that you can download, fill out, turn it into your school campus, and that starts the time ticking to get your child assessed. Our website is www.empowerdyslexia.org. Again, download that template, turn it in. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to us on Facebook. Uh, Twitter, uh, all of all of the original are, you know, the social media handles, we're out there. You can email us. We're here to help. Um, and, you know, we really want to say thank you. Uh, we know that time is valuable. Um, we love doing this show and, and bringing the most relevant information forward for our parents, for our educators making sure that we're all on the same table or same, same place. So our kids get the most relevant, most supported uh, intervention and help so that they can grow up to be the best versions of themselves. So for Empower Dyslexia, I'm Steven Year Out. And until next time, here's a word from our sponsors. Learning Ally is a proud sponsor of the Empowered Dyslexia podcast. At Learning Ally, we are always looking for new ways to engage readers struggling with a reading deficit like dyslexia and help them work to their potential. Visit www.learningally.org to learn about the Learning Ally audiobook solution, including which of your students are eligible for access. If you live in Texas, we have great news. The Texas Education Agency provides access to the Learning Ally audiobook solution for all K-12 public and charter school students with reading deficits. Get started today by visiting www.learningally.org/texas.